Hi, yeah, uh, so good morning everyone. Uh, so I'm Tom, I'm a fuel system test capability <coughs> engineer working in uh, Rolls-Royce control systems. Uh, so in my role I do a lot of design and development of new test rigs, new test equipment, um, and also uh, definition of test methods for certification testing of um, fuel system components for aircraft engine engines. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a bit about probably one of our most uh, maybe most critical and most challenging types of testing, uh, which is which is fire testing. So I'll talk a little bit about the uh, requirements and standards that kind of define how and why you need to do fire testing. Um, a little bit then about more detail of how you define a or define the process and and perform a compliant certification fire test, uh, and then a little bit as well on on kind of unit design um, for fire protection and. Um, and maybe some of the more, more common failure modes that we see in, in fire testing. Uh, so, yeah, so why do we do fire testing? Uh, so, it's a certification requirement for pretty much all aircraft engine components. Um, and the extract from, from the, some of the certification specifications there is really to, to give assurance that the, uh, the design will minimize the probability of occurrence, the consequence, and the spread of fire. And of course, as the top image shows there, um, what we're really trying to do is, is keep everyone safe in the air if, if the worst does happen in an aircraft engine. So that's an example of a, of a fan blade off event um, in an engine that, uh, that caused a fire. Um, and fortunately, the plane was able to land safely. I think it was 24 minutes after the fan blade off event. The aircraft continued to fly safely. The flight crew shut down the engine, prevented the spread of fire. Um, and we're able to, to land, land the plane with everyone safely. And that's really what we're sort of ultimately aiming to do, um, to create safe, safe aircraft engines um, and keep everyone flying around safely. Um, so what are the sort of standards you might be seeing? So top level standards um, from EASA, certification <coughs> specification for, en for engines, probably most of you are familiar with, with most of these, but CSE 130 covers fire protection. The FAA have equivalent standard power plant engineering report number three. So AC2135 and AC3317 cover um, fire protection on that. Um, and RTCA DA160 as a section on fire. And they are all the main sort of top level standards that you're probably all familiar with. And they define very similar, um, very similar requirements for what you need to do to, to have um, a safe engine with respect to fire. Uh, there's also ISO 2685, so that's resistance to fire in designated zones. That's a more specific um, standard that defines um, a bit more how you do the test, so what, the, what burner you have to use, what the flame has to be like, what sort of operating conditions you've got to do. And I'll kind of be talking through what's covered in there um, a bit in the next slides. And then below that, there's a load more additional standards that provide more detail on specific different types of components, so depending on, on what you're needing to test, you might have other applicable standards that kind of give you a bit more guidance on, on what needs to be done. Uh, I'm mainly going to be focusing on engine certification today, um, but there are different standards for other parts of the aircraft. So CS25 covers um, aircraft fire protection. That has totally different types of fire tests, so a lot of, a lot of that is um, sort of more materials, kind of laboratory type tests, looking at heat release of materials and toxic gas emissions and that sort of stuff. Um, so if you're, if you're out there not doing engines, I'm afraid what I'm talking about isn't going to be particularly relevant to you, um, but there are, there are other, other types of fire tests that do need to be done in, in aerospace. But yeah, today, mostly focusing on, on engine fire testing. So ISO 2685, uh, I mentioned types of burners and I mentioned standard flames. So there are two types of burner that you can use, a kerosene burner and a propane burner. So the... Uh, Okay, photo on the top right is a kerosene burner. There should have been a photo of a propane burner, but it seems to have disappeared. Um, uh, it's the kerosene burner and the propane burner. Um, they both have to meet the same standard flame specification. Um, historically, propane was more readily used. It's a, it's a bit of an easier flame to work with. It's easier to calibrate. It's a bit more repeatable, uh, a bit more controlled, and it was historically sort of perceived as a bit easier for the, um, for the unit under test. Um, if the propane picture was there, you'd be able to see it's a, it's a much smaller flame. It looks a lot, a lot cooler, um, and it was and for, for that reason it was it was used quite a lot previously. Nowadays, it's much more likely that the FAA or ARSA will be mandating um, 
the kerosene burner to be used, um, just because it's a lot more realistic of, a, of an engine fire condition. There's a lot of kerosene in, a, in an aircraft engine and not much propane, so you get a much more um, realistic um, representative flame. Uh, the only times really nowadays that you might be um, might have to use propane is, is what we call grandfather rights. So if you've got um, uh, a modification being done to an older unit or you're having to repeat a, a test for a safety investigation or something, um, we, you would be allowed to use the burner that was used previously. So you might, you might find that you can, you can still use propane burners for some types of tests, but most new stuff uh, mandated as the, as the kerosene burner. In terms of a standard flame, so the flame is 1100 degrees C, um, plus or minus 80 degrees C. Um, it's calibrated by an array of thermocouples, so you can see on the bottom right there. Um, if you put the burner up to the thermocouples, hold it there for a set period of time, show you've got the right temperature. Uh, there's also an unwritten requirement that the average temperature is greater than 1093 degrees C as well. So that's to try and make sure you've got a, an even distribution of temperature across your flame. Um, so as well as temperature, you've also got um, the, there's a requirement for what the, the energy of the flame is, so the heat flux density. Uh, that has to be 116 kilowatts per meter squared, plus or minus 10. Um, you do that on a, what's called a continuous flow calorimeter, so that's basically a, a defined copper tube with a with, um, controlled flow of water going through it, and you measure the temperature increase across there, and that tells you how much energy is being imparted. If you want to try and make some sense of those numbers, 116 kilowatts per meter squared is roughly the equivalent of four large gas hobs on your cooker at home, which doesn't sound too bad. Um, or a temperature of 1100 degrees C is a fifth of the surface of the sun, which sounds a little more intense. So depending on what way you want to look at it, you can, uh, you can argue it's not that bad or it's really quite bad. <laughs> um, a load of stuff about the calibration is, is very tightly controlled by the, by the specifications. So every calibration station, wherever you go to do a test, will have to look pretty much exactly the same. The spacing of the thermocouples, the types of thermocouples that are used, um, the setup of the tube, the distance of the burner from everything. Um, all very tightly controlled, um, and you've got to kind of obviously check and demonstrate that all of that is, is correct before you, before you start your test. Um, the calibration method as well is, is tightly controlled, so you've got to ignite the burner for a certain amount of time to allow it to get to temperature, you hold it for five minutes, you then have to move to the thermocouples, sit on those for three minutes to let those get to temperature, and then do a three-minute calibration with a set data acquisition rate and set um, averaging um, of, the, of, the, of the temperatures and same for the heat flux. So everything is, is defined and should be exactly the same for every single fire test no matter, no matter where you are and that's all, all yeah, quite tightly controlled by the standards. Um, you've got to do a calibration of the flame at the start of the test and at the end of the test to show that um, your flame hasn't changed and you've, you've maintained the same, same heat throughout. Um, so, so if you found a shift in the temperature um, that could be a cause of or could mean that your test has failed, even if your unit survived, if something's gone wrong with your burner throughout. So it's, um, it's critical that the, that the burner performs as it should throughout the test. Okay. Um, so what level of fire protection do you need for your unit? So there are two levels of fire protection defined um, in the standards, uh, and they both have different test methods. Um, one is fire resistant, and one is fire proof. Um, the level that a component needs to be, uh, to be proven to is determined by both the function of the, of the component and its location within the engine. So fire resistant is the, is the easier one. Um, your component will need to be fire resistant if it's inside one of the engine fire zones. So um, the little sketches on the right show roughly where the fire zones are on the engine. They're typically around, um, around, the, around the core casing. Um, uh, and around the combustion chamber. So it's really any compartment within the engine that contains an ignition source or potential um, flammable fluid leakage. So all components in those zones have to be fire resistant. Also, all engine control system components have to be fire resistant, whether they're in the fire zone or not. So for example, um, a lot of the engine electronics, so the electronic engine controller, etc., cetera, um, that are mounted on the fan case are well outside the fire zone, but are part of the control system, so have to be proven as fire resistant. That also includes um, all the harnesses and stuff that, that run around the engine as well as part of the control system. Also, all lines or components containing flammable fluids, whether they're in the fire zone or not, have to be fire resistant. Um, things are fireproof if they actually make up the firewall, so the fire boundary of the different compartments within the engine. 
Uh, that's not just the physical structures of those boundaries, but also any valves that fluids pass through those boundaries. So they would be defined as fireproof. Um, also, all flammable fluid tanks and their means of shutoff have to be fireproof, and all oil system components have to be fireproof. So you need to know what your component is, where it is in the engine, um, and what it's doing to understand what level of fire protection you, you need to achieve. In terms of the tests, um, a fire resistant test um, is five minutes in duration. Um, and for those five minutes, the unit has to be operating at what's defined as the worst case operating conditions. Um, for a fire proof test, it's a 15 minute burn duration. Um, the first five minutes is performed again at the worst case operating condition and the remaining 10 minutes is, is with the unit operating at a windmill condition. Um, reason for those times, so five minutes is considered a reasonable amount of time for the fire crew to realize there's a fire, uh, the flight crew to realize there's a fire in the engine and take the appropriate action to shut off all the fuel supplies and shut down the engine safely. Um, that's expected to take up to five minutes, um, so you need to continue operating for that amount of time. Um, once the engine is shut down, it will then be idly windmilling. Um, the fireproof components, um, the extra 10 minutes is to uh, allow the time for the engine fire extinguishment to suppress the fire and or hopefully land the aircraft safely. Um, so that's kind of where the, where the times come from for that. So I mentioned worst case operating conditions. So how do you select um, what your test operating conditions to be? So the EASA spec says operating parameters should be consistent but conservative with respect to the conditions that might occur during an actual fire condition. So conservative, meaning worst case, uh, and an important word, then actual fire situation, so it needs to be a representative operating condition. Um, so if, if it's a condition that could never be achieved on engine or it's a condition as a result of multiple failures already, um, that would not be considered a, an actual representative um, situation. It would be one of your normal operating conditions. Um, so there's a list here of, of, of uh, some of the main parameters that you might see in the, in the engine components and, and what their effect would be on, on, a, on a fire. So fluid flows, one of the main ones, obviously lower fluid flow conditions um, will be worse conditions. So if you've got more flow going through something of a fuel or oil or air or whatever, that's going to be transferring heat away and making it easier for your, for your unit to survive the fire test. So you would run at what would be the lower fluid flow condition. Typically for most applications, that'll be the flight idle condition. Um, if you've got tanks, lower fluid levels, again, um, will be uh, the worst case. So a higher volume just increases the heat sink effect and takes more, more temperature away. Um, Higher fluid pressure conditions are obviously worse as well. Um, increases the risk of seal or material failure. Um, if you've got things like actuators that are under load, higher loads are worst case, um, increasing risk of material failure again. And then finally, higher normal operating temperatures again are worse. Obviously if you start from a hotter temperature, it's gonna take less time to get to your, your critical conditions. So they're in a you know, rough kind of order of importance. So um, you'd normally consider the fluid flow to have the biggest effect out of all those um, sorts of things. Um, and you would select the condition that, that um, matched or, or kind of ticked the most worst case boxes while still making sure it's, um, it's representative and realistic. Um, when you're defining a, a worst case operating condition, it's then very important in terms of your rig design and your instrumentation uh, to make sure you've got uh, the, the right rig set up to allow you to maintain and control and monitor those conditions throughout the test. Because once you've said, I'm going to perform a test at these conditions, and then something happens with your rig during the test and those deviate away and it becomes easier for the unit, um, you'll have a difficult job um, convincing the certifying authorities that you've, that you've done, done the test correctly. Um, so. Um, understanding what your operating conditions are and what the effect of those changing um, is important in your, in your rig design. Okay, so now you know what tests you're doing and you know um, what operating conditions you've got. So where do you need to point the burner? Um, so you need to determine the feature or the location that's most critical to with respect to surviving the effects of fire. Um, so to do that, you do a vulnerability analysis of your unit. Um, there's lots of things to consider. Um, so materials, obviously, aluminium um, has a much lower melting point than 1100 degrees C. Um, so 
can be a weakness. Um, carbon fiber, lots of carbon fiber composites burn quite nicely by themselves. Once you set them on fire, they continue to burn. Um, some titanium and magnesium alloys can feed fires quite impressively um, in the right conditions. Uh, and obviously rubbers and plastics are, are going to melt pretty, pretty easily um, at those sorts of temperatures. Um, so you can consider all the materials that you're using in different parts of your unit. Um, seals, obviously, are a big weakness in, in fire testing. Um, usually rubber or plastic and likely to melt pretty easily and are holding back probably a flammable fluid, um, certainly if you're doing fuel or oil components. Um, lots of things to consider on seal design, so what the extrusion gap is um, in, your, in your seal grooves. Bigger extrusion gap means the seal's going to fail sooner. Um, your depth from the surface, so how much heat transfers in, how quickly into the seal. Um, whether you've got any cooling flow flowing past the seal uh, will obviously benefit you. Um, and what pressure you've got behind the seal, um, more pressure is obviously going to be worse. Um, dynamic seals are much more susceptible um, than uh, static seals as well, so they would score higher in a, in a vulnerability assessment. Um, feature geometry, so wall thicknesses, um, you've got to consider that. Um, thinner wall thicknesses, obviously worse, especially if it's aluminium. Um, protrusions um, on, on bodies will allow the flame to wrap around and attack a, attack a component from three sides, whereas things that are recessed obviously get a lot more protection. Um, your internal fluids, consider your fluid pressures and fluid flows. Um, as part of your vulnerability analysis, so you need to know what operating conditions you're going to be at before you can do a, a complete vulnerability analysis. Um, and then also whether you've already included any specific fire protection features, such as heat shields or um, surface coatings that will help out certain components. Um, and then again, finally, component, shut, uh, component function. So anything that performs a shutdown function or is a safety critical um, component on the engine will score higher as well, as it's um, more likely to have a, have a ultimately challenging effect on the, on the engine. So the photo on the uh, image on the right, top right there, shows a hydromechanical metering unit. So that's quite a, quite a complicated unit with a lot of functionality and a lot of different components. Um, so you've got aluminium body with um, various different um, valves and with different seals, dynamic seals, static seals, um, some machining drillings that are just blanked off. So you've got a static fluid volume behind those with no flow. Um, you've got a lot of electronic interface devices on the top. They're all covered by a heat shield. Um, so there's lots and lots of things to consider on that, and you would identify each of the individual features and components. You'd go down that list, you'd score them all, and whatever comes out highest on your, on your vulnerability analysis is where you point the burner. Um, it is possible that analysis might determine that more than one test is required if you've got multiple vulnerable um, components identified at different parts of the unit, um, although I've never come across anyone volunteering to do more than one fire test on their unit. So uh, people normally manage to make just one, one place that sound vulnerable. Um, you might also want to do some thermal analysis to support your vulnerability analysis. So um, bottom image is showing an actuator. So there were three or four different um, points that were identified as vulnerable. Um, do some thermal analysis, looking at things like your external um, uh, surface temperatures, especially if it's aluminium, to consider whether the material is going to fail, and also looking at the, at the wall temperatures, seal groove temperatures, to see whether your, your seals are likely to fail. And that can help you rule in or out um, specific locations as particularly vulnerable. Uh, so sometimes there's quite a lot to consider. So that's a photo of, a, of an engine oil tank um, undergoing a fire test. That's quite a physically big unit, probably one of the bigger units that we test. It's got um, various different fluid ports. So oil in, oil out, um, air vent on it as well, um, two or three different instruments. There's a filler cap, there's a sight glass around the other side where you've got um, uh, three different materials all kind of, all kind of meeting together there. Uh, so quite a lot of different stuff to consider and obviously stuff at the, wherever you point the flame, the, re the rest of the unit's not really going to see all that much temperature so it's quite important that you pick, pick the right point on that. Um, Sometimes there really isn't very much to consider at all. So if you've got very small units, this is a, um, a small pressure sensor um, and it just gets totally engulfed by the flame. And really <laughs> your vulnerability analysis is a bit moot at that point because um, wherever you're pointing it, the whole unit's getting, getting toasted. Okay, so um, how do you determine what your pass-fail criteria are and how do you assess whether um, your unit has passed or not? Um, so a bit of blurb from the EASA spec that gives you sort of guidance on, on whether you've passed or failed. 
Um, so you need to be able to maintain the ability to perform those functions intended to be provided in case of fire. Um, so what that really means is that they, um, your unit doesn't provide any hazardous engine effects whilst continuing to operate during the fire test. Um, if you can demonstrate that your unit has failed in a way that would cause a safe engine shutdown, that is acceptable. Um, but that's obviously quite a difficult thing to prove on a, small, on a, on a single unit. Um, unless you understand the whole, um, the whole engine system and, and exactly what failure effect would have, and you can demonstrate that very clearly in your, in your um, test report, that's quite a difficult thing to, to demonstrate. Um, but it's something that you cons should consider when writing your procedure and defining your, um, your acceptance criteria, is making it very clear what, what kind of features or what kind of components could be allowed to fail in what way while still being acceptable um, to the test requirements. Uh, also, no leakage of hazardous quantities of flammable fluids, vapors, or other materials. Uh, so the important word there is hazardous quantities. So in general, we would usually say that no leakage at all during or after the burn period. Um, but you could argue that a small leak or, or weep could be acceptable, again, if you can demonstrate that it's non-hazardous to the engine. Um, and again, that's quite a difficult thing to, to prove um, when there's a lot of fire going around and you're and you're saying you've added to it a little bit, but don't worry, it's, it's fine. Um, so uh, we, would, we would generally say no leakage at all. Um, no support of a sustained fire by constituent material of the article being tested. So that means once you've removed the flame, the unit isn't allowed to continue burning and continue feeding the fire. Um, we've seen some things, um, certainly some carbon fiber stuff that continues to burn for quite a long time after the flame's been removed. <coughs> we would typically say that um, there should be a rapid self-extinguishing of any residual flames and no reignition typically within two minutes of the flame removal would be, be roughly the cutoff time um, for that. But it's not clearly defined anywhere in the spec. So um, again, it's something if there's burn on after you've removed the flame, yeah, you've got to make a, a, an engineering justification for that in your test reports. Um, also, no burn through a firewall, so that's fairly fairly straightforward, hopefully, um, and then a bit of a catch-all requirement from the ASRA at the end. No other conditions which could produce hazardous engine effects. So, again, that's a bit open to interpretation and very dependent on what your, what your unit is and, and, and what potential failure you might have seen during a test. In terms of your test definition and rig design, as I mentioned a couple of slides back, your unit operating conditions must be maintained throughout the test, so it's important that your rig is capable of, of maintaining those, those conditions that you defined, or at least not making them easier. If you're going to fail to keep the conditions that you've said you're going to keep, at least make sure they go the wrong way or the worst way, um, so it makes the test harder rather than easier, um, or else you might fail the, you might pass the test but not be able to use the evidence because you're not going to. Um, also, the flame must not be disturbed during the test um, and the conformity must be validated post-test. Uh, so there's a little bit on that in a minute. Um, and also, rig instrumentation and video evidence are critical for accessing acceptance. So some of these things, um, like the, the fluid leakage, like the burn-on after um, sustaining flames, etc., um, video evidence is very important for that to show exactly what was burning and for exactly how long afterwards or to show exactly how much fluid was um, potentially weeping out and what effect that was having on the flame and the rest of the, and the, and the fire and the rest of the system. So very important that you get cameras in the right places, um, looking at the right things that you think are, are risks of failures and you've got a clear, clear view of that. Um, so how do you know whether your unit's passed or failed? Um, sometimes it's pretty obvious whether it's passed or failed. So this is a fuel pump that's being tested. Um, so it's operating so the pump's spinning and you've got pressurized fuel in there. Yeah, we tried to argue this one had passed, but it didn't really fly. So. Um, yeah, so that one had got to exactly five minutes and the burner was removed. Um, and just as the burner was being removed, um, a seal failed on a, on a sensor. Um, so on that one, the video should play around again in a minute. Um, just as the flame removed, you'll see a, a sensor sort of glowing cherry red because it's got um, very hot in the test. Um, it was a steel body sensor in an aluminium housing, so you get a bit of differential expansion in there that widens up your, your seal extrusion gaps. Um, you can see at the top it's quite on a quite um, exposed um, protrusion on the body. Um, it's got um, a static volume of fuel because it's a, it's, a, it's a fuel pressure sensor so you've not got much flow going through it. So 
whilst there were lots of good engineering reasons why it was designed like that, there were lots of things that came together to mean that it's a very vulnerable point for a fire test. Um, and yeah, so that one, that one failed. Um, again, sometimes it's obvious. So this one's a, a generator, um, oil filled. Um, so on this one, the body, aluminium body, literally melted um, and fired the pressurized oil back out uh, and continued to burn on there. So it was quite a thin wall um, aluminium section on there. Uh, with not a huge amount of, of oil flow behind it. Um, so, again, that one didn't go so well either. Um, and let that one play around again. So this was only about six or seven minutes into a 15-minute test, so it was quite a, quite a, long, a long way still to go on this one, um, whereas the other one that failed literally on the five-minute mark was, um, was obviously very close. Jet of oil out, and then everything shut down. Residual burn on that afterwards. Uh, this one, I couldn't find the video of this one, but this was probably one of the most impressive failures that we ever had. So this was an um, accumulator, fuel accumulator on the engine. So literally just a pressurized ball of fluid with no flow in it. Um, they'd set the right pressure in the at the start of the test, um, and they had a regulator to control the pressure, but. It, wasn't, it couldn't vent quick enough, and as the temperature increased, it couldn't vent the fuel back out. So the pressure just rose and rose and rose and rose in the unit until it just exploded because the pressure had gone way above what it should have gone anyway. So that was partly caused by bad rig design because in the engine system, um, the fuel increasing pressure rise would have all vented away and it would have stayed at whatever the operating pressure was. Um, but because the rig was poorly designed and didn't allow that, excess pressure to vent, um, it yeah, exploded pretty well, that one. Um, sometimes you don't have the fluids um, that are your main indicator of failures. Um, so that's an electronic engine controller in EEC. Um, it's obviously one of the most critical parts of the, of the um, engine control system. Um, a lot of different uh, components inside that, a lot of different functionality. Um, some of which is very critical to the engine operation. Um, and it's very difficult to assess whether that component getting to a certain temperature and, and potentially failing is going to cause a hazardous engine condition. Um, and on tests like this, you have to just put a hell of a lot of instrumentation inside it. So we'd have maybe 40 or 50 different thermocouples dotted around the inside on the different um, boards and different components in the, in the EC. Um, so you're trying to measure the temperature all over the all over the unit during the test. Um, so you can say, well, this component reached this specific temperature, and I know that it will continue to operate up to this temperature. Um, sometimes we do them, we do these linked up to, a, to an engine simulation, but again, that has its own challenges in, in kind of assessing performance and justifying that. So sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to, to define pass-fail criteria and determine whether you've actually, actually met that criteria or not. So how do you make sure the test process is compliant? So obviously talked about a lot of things there that are, that are quite important um, in terms of both setup of your facility, um, the burner and that kind of stuff, and um, in terms of setup of uh, the, the test rig for the, for the unit under test, and in terms of the process um, for, for going through the test. So all fire tests have to be witnessed by an approved fire test witness. Um, so your test house might be able to provide one of those. Um, you as the design authority may have your own um, approved test witnesses. Your customer might be able to provide one. Uh, and sometimes the certifying authority requests to come and witness tests as well. So EASA or the FAA may say, you're going to be doing a fire test on that unit. We, we want to come and watch that because we think it's a, it's a critical test that needs to be done right. Um, so yeah, all tests have to be approved. Um, witnessed by, by an approved person. Um, obviously, everything in your, your certifi certifying document goes to the certifying authorities, certifying documentation. Um, and I think the ASA and the FAA pay a little bit more attention to fire test reports than they do to, to some, some other certification tests because it is, as we say, one of the most, most critical. So that's, um, that's reviewed there. Um, and pretty much whatever test house you go to, you're going to be, uh, there'll be some sort of process compliance checklist that's covering a load of stuff there. Um, 
making sure you're making sure you're burning the right unit is an important thing first. We've had, we have our people turn up with the wrong build standard compared to what was written in the procedure. Um, straight away, um, uh, not good. Um, making sure you've got the right yeah, operating conditions, making sure you can achieve that and maintain that. Um, just so much stuff that you've got to, you've got to check both at the start during and after the test um, to, to go through. And of course, unlike a lot of other tests, you only really get one shot at this. If you find that you've, you've done, the, done the conditions wrong, you can't just have another go uh, without a lot of cost and time of, of getting another unit and getting everything set up again. So yeah, there's, there's a, a lot that goes on um, kind of kind of behind the scenes and in advance in the preparation for what is a very, very short test. Um, so main reasons, just as a sort of final summary, main reasons for fire test set failure that, that kind of we see most often. Um, in terms of unit design, like the main one is, is vulnerable seals, um, either um, with high pressure, static volumes of fluid, um, seals that aren't, aren't are very close to the surface. Uh, probably like 80% of the failures that we see are, are through a, a sealed interface, which I'd imagine won't be a surprise to most of you. Um, static fluid volumes, like I mentioned in that accumulator one, is, is another, in another reason that, that things, things fail quite regularly. So again, that affected that pump test that I showed you where you've got a small static volume of fuel in the, in the, um, in the sensor. Um, thin walled sections, so um, yeah, so literally material failure of, um, of, of whatever your housing is on that. Uh, and another one is exposed electrical connectors. So um, if your connector burns through, if you've got internal glass seals, whatever that, that, that burn through, uh, that could cause leakage or it could cause um, a failure of what well, you then fail to send signals out to the engine control system uh, that might be critical to engine function and might create a hazardous um, condition. So that um, is kind of two different ways that those could potentially um, cause your test to fail. Um, other things that we see around, yes, yeah, so it's probably worth saying a lot of unit design is, is, is done with all the best intentions and, and a lot of what you need to do to pass a fire test goes against pretty much everything else that you want to design a unit for in aerospace in terms of cost and weight reduction and simplicity and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, a lot of what you need to do to survive a fire test is put more material on, cover things up, add extra um, heat shields, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and it's trying to find that balance where you can can survive that five minutes um, without um, getting all the cost, expense, and weight of making it completely indestructible. You know, um, there's kind of got to be a, a line somewhere. Um, other reasons for test, te test failures can be to do with with the, the actual test itself rather than the unit. Um, so sometimes it's in the test method definition. Um, sometimes unrealistic worst case operating conditions. Um, so we've seen things where people say, oh, well, low flow is the worst case, so we'll go with no flow. Um, but actually, you're never going to get no flow in an engine, or you shouldn't get no flow in your engine component. And obviously, that makes it um, a, lot, a lot worse on your, on your unit. Um, or um, tanks and saying, oh, well, the worst case is the tank is empty, um, and you've got no, no heat, thermal heat sink there. But of course, you should never get into a situation where you never have an empty tank in normal, or normal operating conditions. So it's making sure you've got realistic worst case conditions. Uh, sometimes we see failures because unachievable operating conditions have been defined. So we've seen things where, I don't know, like a, a pressure um, has been tied down to a couple of PSI um, during a test. And obviously, you've got a fire on the thing and temperatures are changing rapidly and you can't necessarily maintain <coughs> pressures and there's a lot going on and you've gone outside your two PSI pressure range that someone's written into a procedure, um, and then you've got a justification to make why it's okay that you've deviated outside that range. So making sure you've, you're defining achievable operating conditions that can be maintained and that can be monitored. Sometimes it's poor fl test fluid circuit design. So I mentioned the um, trap volumes expanding, failing to vent, um, increased pressures, um, causing pressures to rapidly increase and, and um, in an unrepresentative way um, and causing failures. Sometimes it's the poorly defined acceptance criteria. Um, so you end up having, a, having to write a lot of justification into your test reports that says, well, actually, what I wrote in the procedure, I didn't really mean because this has happened that I didn't foresee. And um, I need to, need to figure out how and, how and why you can, you can demonstrate that what's actually happened is OK and will be OK for the rest of the engine. Um, and then sometimes 
So those are all really kind of to do with the, with the, with the test procedure and your definition of the test. And then occasionally it is um, an, an error in the, in, the, um, in the kind of more operation of the test or the kind of process compliance approval and documentation. Either you've forgotten to, to do some of the bits of the checklist um, and you've not got the evidence that the burner was positioned exactly the right distance from the right component at the start of the test and you can't tell that from the video and you forgot to take the photo of your nice little tool that shows you the right distance away or whatever. And you get to the end of the test and you go, oh, I've not, I've not got that, and the, the ASA or the FAA can then go, well, I, I, can't, I can't agree that you've done that test correctly. Um, obviously, we've got a load of processes, and pretty much any test house should have a lot of processes and checklists and stuff in place to make sure that doesn't happen, but that, that can be a reason um, that the test fails. And, um, the top ones, unit design is obviously a bit more, you can sort of cope with that a little bit, but some of the, some of the bottom ones are a little bit more frustrating um, when, it's, when it's, a, it's a failure of kind of the the test method or the documentation or the, or the process checklist and that kind of stuff can be pretty frustrating if your unit's passed and you know it's good but you can't prove it. So lots of things that you need to think about in terms of, in terms of preparation and defining your test. Um, and that's it for me. So we've just got a very um, short plug at the end. So we've got a, as um, Gemma mentioned at the start, we've got a fire test facility in, um, in Solihull in Birmingham. So um, I designed it, it's great. Um, if, you, if you want to do any fire tests, um, yeah, through Element, so go and speak to the Element guys um, and they'll be able to put you in contact. We've got uh, a little stand outside with some of our capabilities and you can come and speak to us in the breaks if, you, if you're interested in anything. Um, and we've brought our spare burner along if you want to have a little look and prod around, around with that. Um, yeah, and as Gemma mentioned at the start, um, Element do have their own fire test facilities in, in, um, in America. So they've got one in, you've got one in Florida, you've got one in Minnesota and one in California, I think. So they've all got very similar capability to us, um, uh, but obviously over in America, and you might think the logistics of, of going over there with all your kit and, and sending your engineers over there, it's a bit easier to come just to Birmingham. Um, so that's kind of why we're trying to partner with, with Element to, to fill that gap where, where um, you might not want to go to America, but you might still want to use Element, and we'd like to fill up our cell with fire tests. So, uh, yep, so that's, that's it for me. Um, I don't know if I've got time for a couple of questions. I can't remember what time I was supposed to finish. But um, I'll be outside anyway afterwards um, in the breaks and stuff. So if you've got anything, then come and speak to me. So, questions from Big Tom. Yep. So, Pete from Royal Brooks. Yep. Um, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. So, hydrogen, the uh -huh. next challenge in aerospace. Yeah. So, you might recall that in November last year, Rolls Royce ran its first ever gas turbine engine on 100% gaseous hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So that will burn very nicely, right? Yes, yeah, it worked very well. Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, um, and specifically to um, fire testing, and probably a bit of an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. How do you see the Airworthiness authorities having to adjust the certification requirements when we're fire testing with hydrogen <coughs> as the fuel in many of those components that you just described? Yeah. Um, it's going to be difficult. We're on the spot, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's going to be difficult, isn't it? Because a lot of the, a lot of the, um, like some of the fundamental challenges of the unit design um, in terms of both in terms of sealing and in terms of the fluid control are going to be massively different, um, and, and the way that you kind of define a test and the pass fail criteria are going to be very different. Um, I don't know whether a kerosene burner is still the right thing to do and whether you still should use a kerosene burner like for more electric engines and that kind of stuff if we eventually get away from fuel entirely, whether they'll move away from kerosene burners as well. Um, but yeah, it's going to be um, going to have to be quite different, I think, but I'm, I don't know. I don't know how, how different it would need to be and, and, and how you would do it differently. But yeah, it's going to be a challenge for sure. Showed one of your uh, electronic engine control units on, on test. Do you yep. ever do a testing like an electrical component like that? Are you are you is that operational at the time of the test and you're doing functionality? Yeah, so we do. Yes, yeah, so we do do. So the actual picture there wasn't operational. And that was a, a de-risk test that they wanted to do initially. But for a certification test, we would normally have it um, operational, powered up, um, and and hopefully connected to a, an engine simulator. Um, um, yeah, which is quite. A, a bit more effort and, and has its own challenges, um, but yes, it would normally be powered and you would be able to see what components and functions were failing live through the test. Great, that's what, yeah, what, what level of 
clearly you've got to set up a whole load of different sort of interfaces for your test articles, yep. be those yep. fluid or yeah, electrical, yeah. so when they're in the electrical space, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can, yeah, so you can do that. <coughs> uh, presentation time. Um, in these tests, I'm not so familiar with Fox Fiber, uh, so testing, but can you use fire suppression materials in the construction? So that when you is exposed to temperature, it produces a mitigating gas, for example, like burning gas. Uh, so we've not looked at that particularly. I, there, I don't think there's anything in the regulations that would stop you using that. So we've used intumescent paint on some of our units that um, um, protect the unit when it's exposed to fire. Um, that comes with some of its own challenges as well in using that, though, um, uh, especially sort of in, in service. If that paint layer gets damaged, you can't necessarily rely on that all the time and, and other issues in, in production and stuff we've, we've found. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why you, you couldn't use other coatings yeah. Well, so so the engine itself has a has a fire suppression system um, within the within the whole within the whole engine. Um, I can't remember what fluid that uses. Um, Richard, you might know a bit more. No, I, I, I don't know what it um, what it actually uses, but I think the key challenge becomes that your fire suppression system or your fire blanketing needs to become part of your certification argument. So, so in the same way, you need to demonstrate that your fire suppression system was, you know, resistant to fire. So, if, for example, there was a fire and it damaged the control valve for your fire suppression system, you know, so it is an option. You know, like Tom said, we we have used in some paints and that sort of thing in the past that provide fire insulation rather than protection. But absolutely, you just need to think about how you would demonstrate the integrity of whatever system. Yep. How about vibration? Yeah, so the... In the past, and sometimes, I know that you have specified, you know, like 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Yeah. Is it something that's a requirement, or depending on the case, because obviously things are not going to be static. Yeah, yeah, so there, yes, there is a vibration requirement. I didn't touch on it in the presentation, um, but the spec defines um, a vibrational input that the unit has to be subjected to, um, and that ranges from 30 hertz to 50 hertz, depending on um, what type of unit it is. So harnesses and hoses are different uh, structural components, for example. Um, you have to apply that vibration throughout the test. Um, it's an amplitude of, I think, um, 0.8 mil. Um, so relatively low frequency, relatively high displacement. Um, and that is, it's not to replicate the, um, not specifically to replicate the engine vibration, but it's, on engine there would be vibration, which would shake off any burn products or soot, <coughs> and if the unit was static, those would build up on the, on the unit and would start to insulate it and give it an easier ride than it would get on the engine where those things might have been shaken off. So the standard, yeah, does define a vibration um, level that you have to apply. Yep. Um, just to reiterate, Thomas, on really good presentation. Um, and Expanding on the unfair question about hydrogen. Yep. Um, as, as fuels change potentially um, to things like SAF mm -hmm. and hydrogen, how proactive do you see the authorities like CAA and NASA? Because clearly, you know, we can't continue to do the things we've done in the past yep. going forwards. Do you find it's sort of do they come to you, do they proactively work with you around these sort of test methods? Or would you see that going the other way? that you're actually going to say, like, these are the issues around hydrogen, these are the issues around SAF, to take it to them? Yeah, so when, so when um, certifying authorities are looking to update their um, standards, there will, there will always be a, a multi, um, a kind of, international working group. Um, so I'm involved in, S, in an SAE one on hydrogen qualification at the moment, which is very slow going. Um, and I've, only, I've not been involved in it for very long. And, and not a right lot of progress has been made, um, but it does have um, probably 10 or 15 people from all different parts of the aerospace um, aerospace business, um, and it is supposed to just be a discussion on, on what the challenges are and what the best ways are of meeting those. Um, so it's, yeah, it's sort of um, bigger companies certainly are, are normally invited to be part of that sort of working group, and that would be how that works. I do think it will be increasingly up to us in the industry, though, to demonstrate to the authorities why our methodology is good. There's just too much going on in the industry at the moment. You touched on SAP, hydrogen, more, more electric, completely electric. You know, the, the, the reality is 
terms of fire testing specifically, they're developing a new standard for that, but that's been in the pipeline for five or ten years or so and hasn't hasn't been issued yet. Um, and that's kind of adding some of the, I mentioned a couple of requirements that are unwritten that are going to be coming into the new requirement, into the new standard and stuff. But I mean, that's been going on so long that by the time it actually comes out, we'll be yeah more concerned about hydrogen and electric and, and not really bothered about kerosene burners maybe anymore by the time it actually comes out. So it, it is a very, very slow process and, and it, it, sometimes it almost feels like it's one, one step behind in terms of the certification, um, certifying authorities standards um, as opposed to, to kind of where, where the industry necessarily is. Tom? Time's up. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>